Tarun, over okay. to you. Uh, so it's it's my pleasure to invite you all to I mean welcome you all to the eighth Homi Baba uh, Memorial Lecture at ISA Pune. So this is uh, one of the most important events that the physics department hosts, and this is something that uh, my predecessor Professor Sunil Mukhi started in 2016. And we have been lucky to have very, very eminent speakers every, uh, each of the year. And uh, so I'm particularly you know, delighted that Alessandra could uh, find time to do this. I mean, this is amazing. And we hope you will be doing it in person sometime. We have lots of undergraduates who are very happy. So I would now invite uh, Professor Sunil Mukhi to uh, make his presentation on Homi Baba for the students to know of the immense legacy he leaves behind. Sunil, over to you. Thank you, Tarun, and uh, welcome to everyone. So traditionally, I just speak for about 10 minutes, uh, just so that people who might not have uh, known that much about this uh, remarkable person uh, learn a little about him, and then they could uh, read more if they like. Uh, so today, I have uh, I changed the presentation a bit from year to year. So today, I've called it uh, Homi Bhabha, Exemplar of Scientific Leadership. And I'll try to highlight that this person was both an outstanding scientist, as well as an outstanding leader of science, who did an enormous uh, amount uh, so that our country could be the scientific power that it is today. So let me move on. Uh, yeah, so Homi Bhabha was a distinguished physicist who worked in India and for India. His life was tragically cut short by an air accident at Geneva when he was just 57, but it remains an inspiration to all of us. He excelled both as a scientist and a leader, and I'll be saying a few words about his role in both uh, aspects. Uh, today's uh, Bhabha Memorial Lecture is actually the eighth in the series, and we started it in 2014, not 16. Um, and it's uh, remarkable in that it's covered a diverse range of subjects in uh, physics, uh, all kinds of areas of physics. Um, and in this top brief talk, I'll pay a tribute to Bhava by highlighting his science and his leadership. So he was born in Bombay in 1909. And in 1927, he went to Gonville and Keyes College, Cambridge, for a degree in mechanical engineering. His business family actually wanted him to join their uh, join Tata Steel uh, in Jamshedpur as a metallurgist. However, in 1928, he had some kind of epiphany and became converted to uh, physics and wrote to his father that I have no desire to be a successful man or the head of a big firm. I'm burning with a desire to do physics. In 1930, he started, studied under Paul Dirac for math for the math tripos exam, uh, which he obviously cleared. And uh, he later worked with Fowler and he also worked on Dirac's ideas. And his landmark paper in 1935 uh, was on electron positron scattering, which sometimes today is called Bhava scattering for that reason. Uh, he, in 1936, he wrote an influential paper with his advisor Fowler on cosmic ray showers. And he maintained an interest, uh, professional interest in these two areas, or more generally in particle physics with an emphasis on theory, but also a keen interest in experiment. Now, just for you to see, this is the classic paper. It's called the scattering of positrons by electrons with exchange on Dirac's theory of the positron. And when he wrote this, he was 26 years old. And uh, basically the idea here is that when you calculate the amplitude for electron positron scattering, there's not just an exchange uh, of a virtual photon, but there's also an annihilation process where the electron and positron annihilate uh, into a virtual photon. Uh, this is the S channel diagram, we all know this. And uh, this changes considerably the amplitude compared with electron positron, uh, compared with electron electron scattering. And that's the point that he highlighted and he did the calculation. In 1939, he returned to India for a holiday and then couldn't go back to UK due to the war. Uh, just today, I was thinking this is really amusing because people are scared of traveling now because of COVID and they might be stranded somewhere and not be able to come back. But this guy took a, a ship to India uh, while a war was going on. Well, the war was about to break out, I guess. And then he got stranded 
longer, namely the entire rest of his life. Of course, it was his choice because he didn't return at the first available opportunity, but decided that now he was back in India and he would dedicate himself to India. He joined the Institute of Science Bangalore under Raman and set up the Cosmic Ray Research Unit there in the same year. I'm skipping many highlights of his career because of the shortness of time. In 1941, he was elected Fellow of the Royal Society at a relatively young age. Uh, he also had a keen interest in painting and art, in music and so on. And impressed with these abilities, C.V. Raman described him probably with a little hyperbole as a modern Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, in 1943, he decided to set up an advanced research institute with help from the Tatars and the government of Bombay. And he put forward a proposal uh, to the Tata Trust in 1944. And in 1945, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research started in hired space that was just 500 square meters. Uh, not content with starting a fundamental research, research institute, his advocacy for uh, <clears throat> science and technology led to the Atomic Energy Act passed by the government of India in 1948. And in 54, the Atomic Energy Establishment uh, was founded which and the Department of Atomic Energy. And this establishment is now called Bhava Atomic Research Center uh, after his death. In 1954 also, the foundation stone of the TIFR campus in Bombay was laid by Pandit Nehru. In 1955, Bhava presided over the United Nations Conference on Peaceful Uses of Atomic Energy held at Geneva. So he was simultaneously a pure scientist, a science administrator for pure science, setting up TIFR, a science administrator also for applied and atomic uh, research, atomic energy research in particular, and a policy person who, who represented the Indian government uh, in international fora. Now I'll let it you is, hear, sorry, I'll let you hear a few words of his just so that you get a sense. It was in 1943 when I was working at the uh, Indian Institute of Science at Bangalore that I was impressed by the circumstance that Indian science was being hampered by the lack of adequate financial support. I therefore put forward my proposal and it was accepted by the Tata Trust because they considered it a pioneering venture. The Bombay government, as you have just heard, were quick to join this project, which was founded on the 1st June 1945, jointly by the Tata Trust of the government of Bombay. In 1958, he helped to draft the Government of India's Scientific Policy Resolution, uh, which opens as follows. The key to national prosperity, apart from the spirit of the people, lies in the effective combination of three factors, technology, raw materials, and capital. The first is here, perhaps the most important, since new scientific techniques can make up for a deficiency in natural resources and reduce the demands on capital. But technology can only grow out of a study of science and its applications. And this set the tone uh, for the government of India's uh, generous, for, at that time, support not only to technology, but also to basic science. <clears throat> now, in my view, his life story carries several important lessons on academic leadership. And I'll take the liberty of highlighting what I learned from uh, the things that he achieved. The first thing that strikes me about him is his breadth. He was interested in all areas of science, for example, medicine, agriculture, mathematics, atomic energy. Of course, he worked in high energy physics, but he maintained an interest in these, both from the fundamental and the applied point of view, and worked that interest into his broader picture uh, of, of uh, doing to become a scientific power. He showed an enormous concern for the least fortunate Indians, despite or maybe because of coming from a very affluent Parsi family in Bombay. And much of his goal was directed towards uh, changing the life circumstances of the poor, and India was in the 1940s an extremely poor country. He had vision. He foresaw the possibility and the importance of doing fundamental and applied science in India at a high level. By no means this was an obvious thing. Many of our of, country, of, our, of countries in our region and even somewhat far from our region, both to the east and west, have not really managed 
uh, to do fundamental and applied science at a high level for the amount of time we have on the budget, uh, on the kind of economic uh, status that the country had. And it was a lot of faith in the country, a country which had a life expectancy barely less than 40 years at the time of independence, a country whose uh, you know, <clears throat> GDP and whose economic situation was really dire. Uh, he foresaw the possibility and the importance of doing science in spite of all that. He showed dynamism. He founded great institutions and to do so, he invoked the partnership of industry as well as government. And he managed to be friends, close personal friends with the highest in industry and the highest in government. <clears throat> I'll highlight is his involvement. He was involved in all aspects of his institutions, from recruitment of faculty to academic model, how the institute runs. Today, even TIFR talks about Baba's rules or Baba's procedures, uh, to design of the workspace so that it's more effective to do science and to the aesthetics. And here, maybe I should just tell you uh, the story, a bit funny, that he actually had a gardener flown to France uh, so that they, uh, the gardener could see the Chateau de Versailles in Paris, outside Paris, uh, and figure out how a garden should look at Tata Institute in Bombay. Well, those were different days. But I think I would like to highlight here the fact that there was an industry academia government partnership, something we talk about today as if it was invented recently. Uh, this was one of the first, the founding of Tata Institute between the Prime Minister of India, the head of the Tata group and Homi Bhabha. And Bhabha was, of course, the catalyst for this to happen. Uh, now I'm done. I don't want to take any more time. I'll just close with a few pictures. On the top left is Bhabha with uh, Dirac. On the top right is Bhabha with Niels Bohr. And below is Bhabha with, I think this is Blackett. Uh, I could be wrong. Uh, here is Bhabha with the Prime Minister, Pandit Nehru, who actually came and inaugurated the Tata Institute, uh, laid the foundation stone, which is still very much there. And now I'll close with three quotes from Bhabha, which uh, I liked and which I put together for you because I think all of them say something important. The first quote is a bit negative. He says, a majority of the scientists and technologists we have are made less effective through the lack of the right type of administrative support. I think we should ask ourselves whether this is still true today. And when I say we, I mean uh, our faculty, our students, whoever is here today, uh, all of us can play a role to change this. The second was fundamental research requires for its performance a free atmosphere. I love his use of the word performance here. It's not stand-up comedy, it's fundamental research, but it does require a free atmosphere and a country will only succeed if such an atmosphere is present. And the last uh, observation of his that I've quoted, pure and applied research are but two stages of the historical development from ignorance through knowledge to control of the phenomena of nature. With that, I'll stop my presentation. Thank you very much. And over to uh, Thank the- you, Sunil. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, as usual, I, I'm sure it will be very inspiring for both the, the faculty and students. Uh, and I'm sure, uh, you know, Alexandra would have also enjoyed learning about uh, Homi Baba. Uh, let me now pass on the thing to Vijay. And, uh, you know, Vijay, you can proceed with the rest of the- uh, yeah, so uh, I, yeah, so I would Did now, uh, yeah, I would now like to uh, invite uh, uh, Sunita to introduce our uh, today's speaker. So Sunita. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, so it is a pleasure to introduce Professor Alessandra Bonanno. Uh, Professor Bonanno is the director of the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics in Potsdam in Germany. And she's also a professor of physics at the University of Maryland. Uh, she's a member of the LIGO collaboration and one of the leading experts in the world on gravitational waves. Uh, Professor Buonano did her PhD at the University of Pisa in Italy. Uh, subsequently, she held research positions at Geneva, in Paris, and in Pasadena at Caltech before moving to the University of Maryland for a faculty position. As a postdoctoral fellow in Paris, her work in collaboration with Professor Thibaut Damour was a major breakthrough in understanding the two-body problem in general relativity. In a set of papers, they introduced an effective one-body formalism. And these papers were among milestone publications chosen by the journal Physical Review D to celebrate its 50 years. In this and in subsequent work, 
Professor Buonanno has pioneered the calculation of analytical waveforms to describe the gravitational wave signal from a binary black hole merger. She has also created hybrid waveforms with researchers working in numerical simulations of the merger. These waveforms have been used crucially in the detection of gravitational waves by LIPO. Uh, Professor Buonanno is the recipient of several prestigious awards, uh, including the Dirac Medal of the ictp 3 st this year, the Galileo Galilei Award of the INFN in Italy, and the Leibniz Prize of the German Science Foundation, DFG. Uh, this is just to name a few. Uh, today, she will speak on what gravitational waves tell us about the universe. Over to you, Professor Bono. Hey, thank you very much for uh, this nice presentation. And first of all, for having me here today, thank you to, to the organizers. I want a moment to share my screen. Um, Okay, and um, I want to say also I'm deeply honored uh, to give uh, the um, Omibaba Memorial Lecture uh, today, so I hope um, you will enjoy it. <laughs> okay, so let me start uh, um, the picture, the still picture that you have is uh, um, uh, a picture of the visualization of the first collision of two black holes that was discovered by LIGO in 2015 the burst of gravitational waves. Um, and in this uh, talk, I will in fact explain what are, first of all, gravitational waves, uh, how they are produced and how we observe them, uh, which unique information they uh, carry as astronomical messengers, as sometimes we call them. And um, what we have learned until now about the deep and dark universe, through the detection of gravitational waves. As you will see, we have detected many more uh, since uh, the first event. And also which outstanding questions uh, gravitational wave astronomy uh, promises to address in the future, in the short future and the long future. Now, um, since this is uh, um, a lecture address that is addressing uh, also uh, students in science, not necessarily uh, in physics, I want to say a few words about uh, gravity and contrasting the, the theory of gravity as we have learned it uh, starting perhaps uh, the last years of high school. Uh, so the theory uh, of Newton uh, who brought uh, Principia in 1687, which uh, allows us to understand the motion of the planets in the solar system, uh, the dynamics of objects that, that fall uh, on the earth, and um, in, uh, in the theory of gravity of Newton, um, space and time are entity given a priori. Time in particular is absolute in the sense that uh, it is not uh, influenced by the presence of matter or energy. It flows at the same rate everywhere and always. Now, this concept has been uh, uh, completely uh, changed uh, uh, by Einstein uh, with uh, uh, the theory of general relativity um, in 1915, where space-time becomes uh, a dynamic and elastic entity that can be influenced and is also influencing the presence uh, of matter and energy uh, around. And um, gravity in the interpretation of Einstein is the effect of curvature um, in the geometry of space-time which again can be uh, caused by the presence of matter or energy. And uh, the uh, typical um, uh, picture that uh, we always show is uh, this one where we have the sun that um, bends the geometry around, hides in some sense the trajectory for the earth to go around, around the sun. Now, given that gravity and the space time are dynamic and elastic, it's not completely um, strange that uh, in, uh, in the theory of Einstein, um, um, the theory of Einstein predicts the presence of gravitational waves, which were in fact uh, worked out by Einstein in the first paper in 1916, although later, actually after two years, he wrote uh, another paper where he made a couple of corrections uh, of um, a couple of mistakes that he had done in the first, uh, in the first paper. And uh, uh, the gravitational waves are uh, deformations in the space-time itself um, that are uh, produced 
uh, by uh, the uh, temporal variation of the matter or some energy. Uh, and uh, these deformations uh, travel in the space time itself at the speed of light uh, going away from the source. And um, uh, sometimes we say these are ripples in the fabric of space time. This is another still picture picture of uh, two black holes that you see on each other producing this pattern uh, that can resemble the one of ripples in, uh, in water. Now, gravity is among the fundamental forces in nature, uh, the weakest. And uh, in order to produce waves that uh, can travel at the speed of light uh, uh, up to the Earth, produced uh, very far from the Earth, um, we need to have uh, bodies uh, that um, uh, need to be quite uh, compact, we say, in the sense body that can uh, not be broken by, uh, you know, because they have to reach these very large velocities. And uh, the most promising candidates are black holes and uh, neutron stars. So first of all, what are black holes and what is the role that they play in the universe? Uh, a black hole is just a warp space time, in fact, no matter. However, they form uh, through the collapse of massive stars, uh, stars with a mass uh, larger than 15, 20 uh, solar masses. They can also actually form in uh, over dense regions uh, in the very early universe. In this case, uh, we refer to them as primordial black holes. Uh, now, the black holes uh, are so um, compact uh, that, uh, and so the, the gravitational pull is so strong around them that we generally uh, say that uh, um, light and anything else can escape uh, the radius of the black hole that uh, we uh, call the horizon. And just to give you an, an idea, uh, if you have a black hole uh, with a mass 10 times the mass of the sun, the radius, the horizon, is 30 kilometers. And you can contrast this to our sun, which on the other hand has a radius of around 700 kilometers. So you have all this uh, um, warp space time uh, compactified in a very small region. And that's why the gravitational pull is very strong. Uh, and another important thing I wanted to say is that uh, black holes are actually extremely uh, simple objects, uh, the astrophysical black holes are only described by two numbers, uh, the mass uh, and uh, the intrinsic rotation. Of course, the intrinsic rotation is a vector, so you have three actually numbers and the mass is one. Uh, you can contrast this uh, with uh, the fact that if we want to describe uh, many objects in the universe, including <laughs> human beings, uh, you need many more uh, features that uh, describe them but black holes only two. However, despite the fact that these are the simplest objects in nature, black holes do play, we believe they play, a very important role because uh, we have found black holes at the center, for example, of galaxies, of many uh, galaxies. And um, the galaxy is a kind of ecosystem where uh, the black holes have uh, a symbiotic relationship with the galaxy, with the stars. They also influence through the galaxy, the growth of the structure, on the large scale structures. Uh, another interesting thing is that uh, black holes can grow their mass through many two phenomena. One is we call it uh, uh, accretion. They can accrete the gas around uh, and they can increase their mass. And the other is through mergers. So if they are at the center of galaxies, when the galaxy merge, uh, they um, uh, form a new black hole and the black hole has larger mass. And these uh, uh, diagrams here uh, give you an idea. If you have two galaxies, one has a black hole, the other one has no black hole, they merge, and then this is going to merge with another galaxy and uh, so forth. And at the end, you have uh, a growth in the mass of the black holes. Now, another important question is, how do we observe black holes? And uh, if we go back, uh, uh, in the 60s, actually the first uh, candidate, uh, which then uh, more in the 70s, 80s, was realized to be uh, a binary with a black hole, was a Cygnus uh, X1, 
It's a, it's a binary, we did it today, where the companion is a supergiant star. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the object, which is uh, uh, emitting the, because of the uh, accretion disk, which is actually, um, um, I mean, the, the supergiant star is disrupted by the black holes, and this phenomenon heats up uh, uh, temperature and, uh, and emits X-ray. Um, there is a black hole of the order of 915 solar masses. I'm sure many of you know about the black hole at the center of our galaxy, uh, four times, uh, a million times the, uh, the mass of the sun, which has been observed for uh, now a long time through the uh, monitoring of stars, uh, and in part particular the S02 star that you see here that goes around the center. And I'm pretty sure that you have seen this picture uh, in the last couple of years uh, from the Event Horizon Telescope of uh, uh, a black hole in uh, uh, a nearby galaxy, uh, Messier 87. And finally, uh, black holes can form binary systems and they can go around each other. And this is the focus of actually this uh, lecture today because during this process, they can emit gravitational waves. And in fact, uh, when a black hole collides, uh, this is another animation, the space-time rings, and if you have black holes in vacuum, and uh, the black holes that we are observing with LIGO and Virgo are in vacuum, um, there is, because the black hole cannot emit any light anyway, if they are even in vacuum, there is no light that is emitted. We cannot observe these events in, uh, um, with electromagnetic telescopes. So the only way that we can do it is through gravitational waves. Okay, so now I want to do a, um, an analogy or also uh, point out the differences between uh, electromagnetic astronomy that uh, many of you, uh, I'm sure, are familiar, which goes back to more than 400 years ago when Galileo, for the first time, pointed a telescope uh, in the sky. And uh, um, since then, so uh, uh, electromagnetic astronomy uh, uh, started with Galileo in the optical, but since then, we have actually opened different bandwidth in the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, so besides the optical, the ultraviolet, the X-ray, gamma, infrared, and the radio, as you can see here, this is actually the frequency, this is the wavelength. The electromagnetic radiation is produced by incoherent superposition uh, of radiation from individual electrons, atoms, and molecules. And if you observe this radiation in different bandwidth, you can learn about different phenomena that are happening. For example, this is a picture of uh, the Centaurus A galaxy in different light bands. And as you can see just uh, visually, you can have uh, different representation, different uh, um, phenomena that are happening in the same galaxies because you are looking at it in different bandwidth. Now, with gravitational wave astronomy, I mentioned just a few times, the gravitational waves are produced by the accelerator motion, the accelerating motion of mass or energy. And also in this case, one can build the spectrum of gravitational waves. Uh, I did it here. This is actually the frequency of the gravitational wave. Uh, this is the wavelength. And uh, um, as you will see also later on, uh, sometimes we use uh, sounds to represent gravitational waves because at least in the region, uh, the bandwidth of LIGO and Virgo detector, which is around 100 hertz, uh, if you convert uh, the frequency in uh, sound, you can actually uh, hear it. Uh, as you increase, uh, sorry, decrease the frequency, you can have infrasound, you can have millisound, microsound, nanosound. And uh, there are actually today, besides the LIGO and Virgo detector that we will describe more in detail, uh, we have actually waves of uh, detecting gravitational waves using the pulsar and uh, the Earth, and also very, very low frequency cosmic microwave background uh, probes uh, um, are trying to uh, detect uh, through the polarization gravitational wave from the early universe. But now this talk is more about gravitational wave from binary systems. So I want to say a couple of words. The fact that we can uh, actually explore gravitational waves in a big re region of frequency or wavelengths means that uh, you, we can probe black holes 
of different size. You will see in a moment that the gravitational wave uh, frequency related also with the size of the black holes, uh, but also the distance, uh, at which distance the black holes are going around each other. And because we can probe uh, gravitational waves uh, at different uh, wavelengths, we can learn also about the binary system at different epoch of its life, when the two objects were, when they are almost, uh, you know, close to each other to uh, collide and merge. And also black holes can be in different part of the universe. They can be outside, uh, slightly outside galaxy. They could be in globular clusters. So we, we learn through the gravitational waves, uh, the different astrophysical environments in which these black holes are. Uh, however, it's not just a binary system that can emit black, uh, gravitational waves. Uh, in general, cataclysmic phenomena that happen in the universe, uh, cataclysmic phenomena dominated by gravity, which lead to some acceleration motion, can produce gravitational waves. And even uh, the very swift change in the gravitational field itself uh, that determines the universe on large scales uh, uh, can produce gravitational waves. For example, uh, soon after the uh, birth of the universe, uh, during the so-called cosmic uh, um, inflation or cosmic expansion. Okay, so uh, the summary of this is that uh, when sometimes we see this uh, beautiful actually representation of the history of the universe, uh, and we think about electromagnetic radiation that can uh, unveil all these phenomena, actually, almost all of them, can be also probed with gravitational waves. So this is the universe today. Uh, this is going backward in time. And uh, we will see with gravitational waves, we can go up to uh, um, actually looking at black holes at the time in which the first stars formed. But here, even peer back at the very beginning of the evolution of the universe, if we can one day detect the gravitational wave from uh, cosmic inflation. Okay, so now I will enter more in uh, um, the uh, uh, topic of uh, the binary system for this talk. And so let me say a couple of uh, order of magnitudes and uh, the main things that produce uh, gravitational wave, the main ingredients. So the source has to be dominated by gravity. Uh, now for um, the case in which uh, we have uh, um, uh, astrophysical uh, uh, sources that produce gravitational wave, uh, the waves are produced by the variation in time of the quadruple moment of the source. So if you have a sphere, um, if you have an object which has uh, the shape of a sphere, or even if it is just uh, rotating, uh, is axisymmetric, um, it does not produce gravitational waves. You have to have, if you have just one object that rotates, like for example, the Earth, which has some bumps, um, and uh, uh, the strain, which is uh, the strength of the gravitational wave, is also inversely proportional to the distance to the source. And so we would like these sources to be very close to the Earth, uh, but uh, um, the collision does not happen very often. Uh, and so you have to increase the volume in order to uh, have uh, many collisions. And that's why actually uh, we have to go a very large distance so that we have a big volume and uh, be lucky that uh, some collision happen in that volume. And that's why also the waves that arrive on the earth are very weak because the distance typically is quite large. Uh, now the typical strengths, when you put some numbers here, you consider the waves uh, that are at the distance we see with LIGO and Virgo, we are talking about a very tiny number, 10 to the minus 21. This is a dimensionless number for binary systems. However, if you look at the luminosity, so the gravitational wave power is actually much, much larger than the one in electromagnetic radiation that comes from the sun. And uh, in fact, this is uh, um, similar or larger the all visible universe, but is produced uh, in a very short amount of time, just very close to the point in which the two black holes basically collide with each other. Now, I said at the beginning that gravitational waves are very weak because gravity is weak. This is also a reason why um, uh, these uh, sources do not uh, uh, interact much with the environment, although you will see at the end of, toward the end of my talk, uh, 
uh, that they are subject to phenomena like lensing, for example. But uh, as a first, in first approximation, they are really pristine probes. They are not very much affected by whatever they encounter as they travel from the source to the Earth. Now, the way in which we detect gravitational waves, I'm sure you have already heard about this, is uh, um, uh, through uh, interferometer, gravitational wave interferometer. These are the picture of uh, LIGO and, uh, and Virgo, and this is a scheme of interferometer. And the key idea that we use uh, is the fact that when gravitational waves uh, uh, interact, uh, for example, with a ring of particles free of moving, and you have a wave that impinges on the screen of the ring, uh, they, the, the particles are put in motion in this way. And so what uh, you do is that you have mirrors that hang by wire, free above uh, a few hertz. And um, when the gravitational wave arrive, you monitor the differential uh, 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 motion of, uh, of the mirrors. And uh, the scheme of the interferometer is such that if the length of the cavities is the same, you don't have any light that comes out from the beam splitter. But otherwise, you have some lights leaks here, and you can detect on the photodetector. And in order to detect waves with this strain, we need to monitor differential displacement of the mirror at the level of 10 to the minus 16 centimeter, which is quite amazing. We are talking about the 10,000 of a proton diameter. But this is possible. This has been done uh, after many, many years of, uh, of work. OK. So let's go more now about uh, the waves uh, uh, themselves. So these are, this is an animation on the left that represents uh, five uh, binary black hole waveform detected by LIGO and Virgo. And the one in yellow here, it's a waveform for, from uh, a binary neutral star. Uh, by the way, these numbers here just refer to the year, uh, the month, and the date, the day in which the uh, signal was discovered. So um, in order to understand why we have different uh, length okay, for this signal, for black holes and for binary neutrons, uh, we can use, uh, first of all, uh, uh, the fact that uh, we learn in Newtonian gravity, in classical mechanics, uh, that if you are uh, describing uh, the motion of two objects going around each other, the orbital frequency, just Newtonian yeah. OK, that's a neutral star that is colliding. <laughs> uh, the orbital frequency is related to the orbital separation through this formula, where m is the total mass of the binary. The gravitational wave frequency will be just a multiple of the orbital frequency. Now, at some point, these two objects collide and merge. And the gravitational wave frequency at merge is inversely proportional to the total mass of the binary. So this means if you take a two neutron star, the typical mass of the neutron star is 1.4 times the mass of the sun, the merger is in the kilohertz. The bandwidth of this detector starts around 10, 20 hertz. So you have a, an the, the signal accumulates for a long time for a binary neutron star. That's why it's very long. But for a binary black hole, if you take 10, 20, even 90 solar masses for a black hole, black hole has a mass larger than a neutron star, they merge at much lower frequency. In fact, at some point, the mass, uh, if it becomes uh, million solar masses, like the one of the black hole at the center of our galaxy, we are, is going to the binary to merge millisecond in uh, milliards, sorry, and so outside the bandwidth of the detectors on the Earth. Now, a few words about the shapes of the waves. Um, as you can see here, because the two bodies are going around each other. The system is losing energy because of the emission of gravitational waves. The separation shrinks over time. The two objects come closer and closer to each other. The frequency is increasing. And so from the frequency evolution, we can infer the masses. From the amplitude of the, uh, of the wave and the masses, we can reconstruct the distance of the source to the Earth. From the time of arrival, the amplitude and the phase of the waves at the detector's location, we can reconstruct the sky location, where was actually the source in the sky. And finally, if we observe the modulations in the amplitude, but also in the phase of the waveform, we can learn whether the two objects, black holes or neutron stars, were spinning, had an intrinsic rotation, or whether the orbit was circular or was elliptic, was eccentric. 
Finally, uh, if we compare this waveform with the theory alternative to general, uh, we can actually probe the uh, theory of gravity. Is it uh, the Einstein theory of gravity or something else? Okay, so now um, the shapes of the waveforms, uh, uh, I sometimes call them the fingerprints, are very important because uh, the way in which we detect these signals, uh, at least uh, uh, the so-called model search, uses uh, uh, signal processing or match filtering. And I want to uh, explain this with a simple animation here. So uh, the um, uh, lower plot here shows uh, the data uh, the, uh, in the detector, uh, which may contain a gravitational wave in a black. Uh, and uh, the panel here uh, shows uh, uh, the correlation between the data and the evolution in time or the correlation between the data and the template. A template is something that we uh, build using the theory of Einstein. And as you can see in this animation, we slide basically the template on the data. And if at some point the data contains a signal, as you can see here, the correlation or the signal to noise ratio rises above a, a certain threshold. Now, in order to apply this signal processing, we actually need a bank of templates or many, many templates. In fact, we need several hundred signals and more even if we want after the detection to go uh, to try to extract the properties doing the Bayesian analysis, inference analysis, we need millions of them. So this is just to say that we need to have a very accurate prediction of these uh, templates uh, for uh, uh, the collision of black holes or neutron stars. Uh, so uh, in order to address this problem, uh, we tackle it uh, with uh, two tools at our disposal. One we call analytical and the other numerical. So just a few words, because I don't know if everybody here knows what uh, uh, I mean by analytic or approximate analytic model. And I want to make an, uh, an analogy again. If we go back to Newtonian gravity, uh, you can have uh, Newtonian gravity, the two body problem can be solve exactly as you may have done in your course in classical mechanics or maybe even in high school. And uh, this is the formula for the orbit is analytical, uh, but you can also have a numerical representation. No? This is the sun, this is the planet, this is the distance, the periastron, um, and this is the so-called ellipticity parameter. Now, unfortunately, in general relativity, we don't have an exact formula for the orbit. Um, uh, the ellipticity, example, uh, is no longer even fixed in space. It rotates like an aeroset and also shrinks in time because uh, in uh, the theory of general relativity, you have gravitational waves. So the system is losing energy because of the emission of gravitational waves. However, it's possible to find approximate analytic models for the orbit. And so what we do is that we work together, analytic and numerical people, uh, there is a method, analytical one, that we call also paper and pencil. Uh, this is fast, which is very important if you have to produce 100,000 of templates, but it's approximate. And then we have people working on supercomputers. This is the slow way, but accurate. And the reason why is the slow way is because if you want to do a numerical simulation of 15, 20 orbits, two black holes going around each other, it may take even one month depending on the parameter. So you cannot produce hundred thousands or millions of templates just using numerical relativity. Now, I want to go a little bit more specific without hoping to be too technical. So basically we have to solve the so-called two-body problem in general relativity. And uh, I write here just in full glory, uh, the uh, Einstein equation, although it who have never seen it to understand them from this slide. Uh, but this quantity here represents the curvature. Uh, it depends on the gravitational field of the metric. This is the energy momentum tensor, Newton constant, uh, the gravitational constant, uh, see the speed of light. The complication, as I said, is the theory of gravity is nonlinear. So we have to uh, apply both methods, analytical and numerical. And just to give you a hint, uh, a little bit more about what does it mean analytical. 
many of you are familiar with theory which are nonlinear. And the first thing you can do is that, okay, let's do a, a perturbation analysis. There, there is maybe a small parameter that can expand this equation with respect to a small parameter. And for the case of a binary system going around each other, there is a small parameter, uh, which is the velocity of the binary divided by the speed of light. And we call this approximation, this expansion of the Einstein equation, the post-Newtonian expansion, which is particularly valid when the two objects are very far from each other. But there are other expansions. You can expand uh, in G itself, and uh, you don't expand in the velocity. This is called the post minkowskian approximation. Um, you can also expand in the mass ratio. If you have uh, in the binary, one body is much larger than the other, you can do an expansion of the Einstein equation. The other. Uh, and then what we do is that just in a nutshell, uh, we actually combine all these methods uh, with uh, the fatty one body theory, also doing phenomenological fits. Uh, and uh, we put together all these analytical methods in one framework. Uh, this method provides uh, a coalescent signal, including also the merger in down in red here. Uh, but then we improve these models using numerical relativity so that we can basically um, uh, bring the, the model very close to numerical relativity simulation. We do it for only a certain number of simulations because we cannot produce many of them, as I, I told you before. Okay, so with uh, all this information, uh, I want then to tell you what we discovered. So I'm sure you know about the results in 2015. A famous figure from the discovery paper of uh, 150914. Uh, this is the uh, signal as seen in the two LIGO detectors. Uh, you see here in gray the reconstructed signal using the templates that I was trying to describe to you. And uh, you also see in red and in blue a numerical relativity simulation, which is super, you can see also it match very well. This is a binary black hole system. And sometimes we, we actually represent the data uh, uh, that we see in plots like uh, frequency and time. And you see the frequency is increasing. Uh, as I was telling you, you have this uh, chirp. And uh, the chirp can also be heard, uh, as you, I'm sure you have heard many times. Uh, and this was amazing, this discovery. Um, it actually. Um, 2017, uh, revised uh, very, very Shenkipton got the Nobel Prize for this discovery. Now, besides the discovery, beyond the discovery, we are interested uh, in uh, extracting the parameters. So again, just for this source, because then this is applied for all the others that we have detected. Uh, this is again an animation. Uh, these are the data in blue, and the template uh, is in uh, uh, orange or yellow. And here you can see the variation in distance and the total mass. And in the animation, you see that uh, we are trying to match uh, these templates against the data. And we have to you know, stretch using the parameters on which the template uh, depends on until we can match very well the data with it. More um, uh, quantitatively, uh, professionally, uh, we do a Bayesian analysis, we end up uh, with plots like this that shows the posterior distribution or the probability that uh, the masses for this source uh, were in this range. This is at 90% the probability that the mass of the primary was around 35 and the mass of the secondary was around 29. And in fact, just to give you the number, these were the distance, this uh, object was observed, uh, the masses, and we could also reconstruct the mass of the final object that forms uh, formed after the merger, and even the intrinsic rotation of that object, 67% of the maximum uh, rotation, uh, which is allowed by uh, general relativity. So now, since then, uh, this is quite amazing, uh, the LIGO and Virgo detectors have discovered that uh, in total, 90 cosmic collisions. And this is a beautiful representation of the results. So let me explain slowly. Uh, on the y-axis, you have the solar masses um, of the uh, uh, compact objects that were discovered. In blue 
are all the binary black holes discovered by Lycon, Virgo, and also Mekagra recently joined with the MOU, the Lycon Virgo collaboration, uh, and see the component masses and the final black hole, the component masses in the binary, the final black hole. You can appreciate the variety in the mass distribution. Uh, the first one had uh, a mass, uh, we, uh, we just saw 29 and 36, but now we can go up to even uh, a total mass of 150 solar masses. And, and here, quite amazingly, we have also discovered a binary neutron star. I will describe this in a moment more. Uh, a neutron star, neutron star, uh, very likely merging into a black hole, and even a neutron star and a black hole uh, merging then into a black hole. And this plot shows you also another two other interesting information. In red, you see here the black holes that we see in X-ray, like the Cygnus X1 that I was showing you at the beginning of my uh, lecture. And you can see that the masses of uh, these black holes that we see in electromagnetic radiation are actually smaller than the one that we see for, from, uh, for LIGO and Virgo. And in yellow here, you see the uh, neutron stars, uh, a spulsar that we obse observe in our galaxy, um, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, many of them actually, and which is also interesting to see, to see here. So with this question of uh, black holes and neutron stars that we have discovered, there are many questions that we are trying to answer. Uh, how black holes and neutron stars form? Uh, which is their astrophysical environment. Uh, how these black holes and neutron stars end up uh, in binary systems? Um, in particular, in the case of neutron star, because we have matter, uh, very high density, we want to understand what neutron stars are made of. What is the equation of state of neutron star? Uh, another interesting question is, uh, uh, can dark matter make uh, uh, compact objects? Uh, for example, if we can, uh, some of these black holes are primordial black holes, maybe these primordial black holes uh, could explain part of the dark matter. Um, what's the origin of the most energetic phenomenon in our universe? We will see in a moment that the discovery of the binary neutron star has unveiled at least one of these phenomena. And finally, uh, can we actually discover new fundamental particles through gravitational waves? And can we learn more about the cosmological model of our universe through gravitational wave observation? So what I'm going to do now is to pick some of these events that have been discovered and tell you their peculiarities. And I want to start with an event that did uh, the, uh, the 14th of August, 2019. Uh, this was uh, now uh, done um, uh, binary with a, a puzzling companion. Why? Because uh, the binary, the, la the uh, larger component, the primary component, is certainly a black hole, as a mass 23 times the mass of the sun but is merging with an object which has a mass of 2.6 times the mass of the sun. Now, a neutron star, uh, we believe, uh, have as a mass, a maximum mass around maybe 2.1, 2.2 solar masses. We have not seen black holes with a mass uh, smaller than five solar masses in the electromagnetic radiation, uh, uh, with electromagnetic probes. So we don't know what a companion is. And now, because this binary, the two masses were quite different from each other, there was some asymmetry in the binary that produced a beautiful, actually, gravitational waveform, which you see here as uh, in the last 10 seconds of the evolution of this event. This is a, a numerical simulation visualization that we did in our group. Um, uh, the two objects are going around each other, as you can see here. But because of the asymmetry, you don't only see the main harmonic, uh, the quadruple one, but you start seeing the octupolar, uh, octupolar radiation uh, as the two bodies approach each other, uh, and then uh, the higher modes uh, even. Uh, so you have to think of it as, uh, as I wrote here, if you have uh, a binary where the two objects have the same mass, um, they emit the same sounds, okay? Uh, it's like in a musical duet, but uh, if the two objects, the two black holes have different masses, uh, you, the, you can have uh, a richer, you know, music that comes out. And that's why you have all these harmonics. Uh, let me go a little bit more 
to detail about this, I wanted to say that uh, this is just the last part of the evolution where the black holes you can see is uh, uh, merging, the two black holes are merging with each other. And just to be a little bit more quantitative, I want to go back to another posterior distribution because uh, uh, at the end of the day, this is what we extract from the data. Uh, just to make the following point. For this source, it was very important to understand the mass of the companion because it was is puzzling. Uh, and we wanted to get it very accurately. So we have 2.6 with this error, okay? And for this, you really needed a very accurate waveforms. The waveform had to include this harmonics, that visualization, and they had also to include the fact that the spins of the black holes were able to precess, okay? And uh, if we didn't include this effect, we would have a much broader posterior distribution. We would not be able to nail down the mass of the secondary very well as uh, was done. Okay, let me go now to another uh, event. This is, was detected the 12th of uh, uh, April of 2019, uh, was the first binary black hole detected with asymmetry. Uh, uh, the mass ratio, in fact, was around four. And also in this case, uh, um, okay, we couldn't see so well the harmonics as in the other case, because there the mass ratio was around 10. Uh, but still, um, uh, we could have some hint of the higher harmonics. And uh, in this case, also the spin of or intrinsic rotation of the binary black hole was measured at the level of 40% uh, uh, or the possible maximum value allowed by general relativity. Uh, finally, about the binary black hole, uh, the 5th of uh, the 21st of uh, May 2019, uh, the larger, uh, uh, largest binary black hole was discovered by Ligo and Virgo. The signal was extremely short because as you increase the mass, uh, as I told you at the beginning with the animation, uh, as the system entered the bandwidth of the detector, basically it immediately merges. So the signal is very strong, is very short. And um, uh, in this case, uh, the mass of the larger object in the binary was around 80 times the mass of the sun. And this uh, posing some uh, challenging, some theoretical understanding of how this black hole form from the collapse of star. You can ask me at the end, I guess. Okay, so now I wanted to say a few words about the test of general relativity that we can do with these sources. Um, by the way, how I'm doing with the time? Because I have another maybe 15 minutes. Is that the case? Or maybe? Uh, yes, Alessandra. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, sure. Please yeah. tell me because I might. <laughs> sure. Um, okay, so, uh, so then what I want to say is that uh, Another uh, amazing thing that uh, gravitational waves can offer us from binary system is to probe general relativity in a regime that we cannot probe otherwise. Uh, because, for example, the test of general relativity that we do in, uh, in the solar system with the planets that go around the sun are probing the weak gravity and slow velocity. Uh, the velocity of the planet uh, with respect to the speed of light is something like 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus, actually 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6. In the case of uh, the system we are observing here, they almost reach the speed of light when they collide. So we are in the so-called strong, highly dynamical space-time. And I have here another simulation um, that actually represents a very long signal that was observed. This was the second signal ever observed by LIGO in 2015. And now, if you have a numerical relativity simulation, which is this one that represents the signal, um, you can actually uh, compare this simulation uh, with uh, the reconstructed uh, uh, signal using the template. So again, uh, this is uh, uh, the event. Uh, you see in gray the gravitational wave waveform with the 90% credible regions. This is just a zoom. And you can see that the numerical relativity simulation, which was produced taking data uh, consistent with uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the reconstructed template at the very beginning of the event at very low frequency, it remains within the 90% over all the evolution up to the merger and the ring down. So it's a bit difficult uh, unless I to explain 
how we do this test, but the bottom line is that we basically compare uh, the, the data, the reconstructed signal that we obtain from the data with the uh, prediction that we have from GR, from general relativity. And in some cases, the best prediction comes from the numerical relativity simulations. And in fact, until now, uh, the gravitational signals very close match the exact solution from Einstein equations of two black holes in the case of binary black holes. Of course, with an error, because uh, so, but uh, it's, you know, basically general relativity uh, match the data uh, at a certain, with a certain statistical significance. Uh, but one example I wanted to actually uh, give a little bit more in, uh, uh, in detail is the last part. When the two objects merge with each other, the so-called ring down uh, phase. When a new black hole form, uh, in the phase of forming, the black hole also rings space time in the form of uh, quasi normal modes, unlike the modes of a bell when you perturb the bell. And I want to make a similarity. Uh, the spectral lines uh, that you can observe identify chemical elements, whether it's hydrogen, neon, or beryllium. But it turns out that these quasi normal modes can identify, if you can detect them, the black holes, and also can identify their properties, their mass and spin. I told you at the beginning, the black holes are the simplest object in the universe. Astrophysical black holes are described by mass and spin. Well, the quasi-normal modes of a black hole only depend on the mass and the spin of the black hole. So if you can measure uh, these quasi-normal modes and also more, uh, more than one, you can do consistency tests and you can uh, um, uh, understand or disprove that the remnant object is a black hole as predicted by the theory of general relativity. And these tests have been done with uh, many of the events uh, of that big table that I was showing you before. And until now, um, everything matches the quasi normal modes of a black hole in general relativity. So, again, general relativity passes um, the test with, uh, as we say, flying uh, colors. Okay, so now I want to describe uh, um, the case of binary neutron stars because until now we have talked about black holes. But um, uh, we are also uh, observing binary neutron star. And uh, a neutron star is also quite compact. Uh, it has uh, a mass between 1 and 2 solar masses, a radius between 9 and 15. And uh, the, we don't know, actually, the composition uh, of, uh, of a neutron star, the equation of state. Of course, at a certain level, uh, it's <laughs> composed of neutrons. But uh, if you go into the core of the neutron star, because of the high pressure, at some point, if you go above uh, supernuclear density, um, uh, you don't see there are no, no longer neutrons. Uh, you may have uh, just uh, quarks. Uh, you can have uh, hyperons. You can have condensate of pions, of kions, et cetera. Uh, now, how can we actually probe uh, the internal structure of the neutron star? Uh, well, this is due to the fact that uh, uh, the neutron stars uh, can be deformed, uh, and this deformation has an imprint on the waveform. So I just wanted to give you a, just as an example uh, how much actually the neutron star can be deformed and how the radius of the neutron star can be. So if you take uh, a neutron star with a mass 1.4 solar masses, uh, if you look at at a black hole with the same mass, uh, that would be the size. Okay, I'm actually here in Germany. This is Potsdam. This is Berlin. Uh, now, on the other hand, for the same with the same mass, depending on the um, uh, nuclear force um, and the equation of state of the neutron star, um, less repulsive nuclear force lead to a, a smaller neutron star. For example, eight kilometer. But uh, if you have more repulsive nuclear force, you can have uh, a neutron star which is bigger because it's more easily deformable. So uh, there is a parameter that can describe these deformations that happen when the, either a neutron star um, merges into a black hole or when you have two neutron stars. And so in this uh, um, picture here, 
I'm just showing you contrasting the signal of a binary black hole in black with the same masses as a neutron star with the signal of, uh, in red of a binary neutron star. At very large separation, they are very similar to each other. But then as the two bodies come close to each other, the neutron star uh, has um, tides. There is this tidal deformability, which is actually zero for black holes. And so the signals start to become different, more different. And we want basically to measure these differences. Also, of course, the merger is going to be different for a binary neutron star. And we have done it actually with uh, the first binary neutron star uh, discovered by LIGO. This is just an old plot from the, the, the discovery paper, which shows uh, uh, the pressure and the density, how much uh, could be constrained by the detection um, of this source with, uh, uh, with LIGO and Virgo. Um, and this, again, notice uh, this is twice uh, uh, the density of uh, uh, twice a nuclear density, as you can see here, just to have uh, you know an idea. And um, this analysis uh, uh, have led to, um, uh, for example, a radius of the neutron star around 12 uh, kilometers. But uh, actually, there have been many papers uh, since uh, this 2018 paper, and there are uh, many more analyses that have been done. But uh, the um, uh, amazing thing of this source uh, was not just the extraction, I mean, trying to understand uh, the internal structure of the neutron star, was that uh, this actually source of so-called multi-messenger astronomy. Uh, because uh, um, uh, soon after the signal was detected in, the, in LIGO, and you can see here the frequency time uh, plot, after a uh, little bit less than two se seconds, uh, it was actually uh, observed by the uh, Fermi satellite, a um, short gamma ray burst. And uh, this was actually the event that allowed to understand the origin of short gamma ray burst, which at, until that time, uh, we didn't know if uh, there were, of course, there were actually um, uh, theories that were predicting they could be produced by the collision of neutron star, but it was not actually proven until this point. And uh, not only we have seen the gamma, but uh, after more or less uh, uh, 11 hours, thanks to the reconstruction in the sky of uh, the source, this is the reconstruction of the event uh, by LIGO and Virgo, this region, um, the telescope could actually observe uh, the event here, the source, uh, very close to a galaxy. Uh, you can contrast this with the image that was taken uh, 20.5 days before, where there was no actually this event. And in fact, this source, uh, 1708, it's actually represented here in, uh, in a simulation um, uh, that uh, uh, was done in our department at the time. Uh, you have the two neutron stars going around each other, as you can see here, now it's zooming. Now, because they have matter, you can now see that the, the ejecta uh, uh, and then uh, an hypermassive neutron star forms. And then we think, uh, although this is not proven by the data, a black hole then uh, form at the end when uh, um, the hypermassive the neutron star actually collapses. So as I said, uh, we observe for this signal the gravitational wave, uh, the gamma, um, and then uh, the kilonova, which was the signal observed in the optical infrared, and even the radio after weeks and months. So this was really an amazing, uh, uh, amazing event. Uh, now, uh, the other important thing that this event had was to shed light on uh, the origin of the heavy, uh, heavy elements, uh, some of them. Uh, and uh, this is, was also quite, um, quite, quite important. Uh, this is just a picture of the um, uh, table of the periodic elements. And you can see some of them, uh, we, we think, uh, uh, no doubt, hydrogen and helium form uh, you know, at the time of the Big Bang. Uh, but as you go to the yellow and orange, uh, was actually uh, not clear. And now we know, for example, that gold, uh, for the majority, was, was uh, uh, observed in, um, in collision, of, is produced by the collision of black holes. Oops. Oh, sorry, I went a little bit too fast. And also uh, thorium, uh, uranium, and plutonium. 
So uh, gravitational waves are allowing us also to answer these kind of questions. Now, this is for the binary neutron star. Now we go to the uh, neutron star black hole, uh, the first robot detection of a mixed binary. Uh, this is also the visualization, the numerical simulation and the visualization. You can see the two objects uh, going around each other. Um, and because of the parameters, uh, in this case, the um, black hole swallows the neutron star basically all without leaving anything, any accretion disk. And that's why we think also because the localization in the sky was not very good. We have not observed any uh, counterpart actually from this uh, event, but in the future we can. And people have produced simulations where if you have certain parameters uh, for the mass ratio in the binary, the spin of the black hole, you can actually have a situation in which you form an accretion disk around the black hole. Uh, and so you could actually trigger electromagnetic counterparts. Okay, so let me go now toward the end. I wanted actually to um, touch also, maybe this is the last science thing I wanted to say, which is uh, um, we can also use gravitational waves uh, to uh, do cosmography, which means to learn more about the cosmological model of our universe. Uh, binaries of black holes and neutron stars are standard candles, or sometimes we say sarans, if we think about uh, sounds. And um, uh, what does it mean, standard candles? means that the sources um, are such that their distance from the Earth can be inferred just from the luminosity. And uh, we could actually use uh, gravitational waves as standard candles, or siren, for gravitational waves 17.0817, the binary neutron star, because uh, um, we uh, could observe, uh, so first of all, let me tell you uh, this law that says uh, um, that um, the Hubble flow velocity is uh, related to the distance of the source to the Hubble. So we want to measure the Hubble constant with gravitational waves. We can extract the distance from the luminosity from the gravitational wave. How do we extract the Hubble flow velocity uh, from basically the identification of the galaxy uh, uh, and uh, which corresponds to a electromagnetic counterpart? If we see an electromagnetic counterpart, which was possible for gravitational wave 170817. And so by doing that, we could measure uh, for the first time with gravitational wave the Hubble constant. And again, this is uh, again a possible distribution for this parameter uh, determine at one sigma and two sigma is not a very precise measurement, not better than what we have today with other probes, but it's the first time that we have it with gravitational waves, and this will improve in the future. Uh, in the last years, we have been also uh, looking at possibility of gravitational waves being lensed, because gravitational waves are like uh, any other waves. When they pass through objects, they can be lens like light. Uh, this is a picture that shows this is a quasar. Um, this is the Earth. And here you have a lens, a, a galaxy. And um, actually, using the theory of Einstein, you can actually um, out the multiple images of the quasar, which are indicated here. And you can do the same with gravitational waves. You have a binary system. Which is, emit, which is uh, uh, detected somewhere here, it passes through the universe, through clusters of galaxies or galaxies, and gravitational waves can be lens by object that they um, pass through, although very tiny, but because we are improving the sensitivity, this can be seen. Now, the lensing magnification can produce uh, an overall amplification of the gravitational waves that can be measured, and uh, even more interestingly, the multiple images that in the case of light uh, are represented here, in the case of gravitational waves, uh, means that you observe multiple signals, repeated gravitational events. So you have a gravitational wave event of a source, but after a certain time that can range between days, months, years, it depends on the parameters, you can actually see another signal from the same source. 
Okay. Uh, so let me now uh, conclude with the last few slides. I have, uh, I think, three, four slides. I'm, I'm okay, or? Um... Yes, yes, Okay. absolutely. Yes, so before finishing, I wanted to, however, say that there are other sources that can produce gravitational waves. So because now we are gravitational wave from binary system, all my presentation was focusing on that. But if you have uh, the collapse of massive stars, uh, they can produce gravitational waves, uh, and the signal is very short. It's an unshaped burst uh, lasting for tens of milliseconds. So you will hear something like just a beep. Okay. Um, moreover, if you have uh, pulsars uh, that ro which are highly magnetic neutral star, they rotate. If the pulsar has um, some deviation on the surface from uh, um, you know, axisymmetry, uh, like some little mountains, um, but it's very difficult actually to have mountains on um, a pulsar, a neutron star, because the gravitational pull is very strong. You can produce maybe uh, mountains of one centimeter in height, but the motion, the rotation, uh, together with the bumps, uh, produce a continuous and periodic signal, which you can hear in this uh, you know, animation here. And this could be detected. There are searches to, to look for these signals today. And as the sensitivity improves in the future, we might actually detect these signals. And finally, one day um, we will, uh, I believe, uh, uh, I mean, if the signal was produced and we will reach enough sensitivity, we will peer back to the very early moments of our universe uh, um, measuring uh, the signal from uh, the so-called cosmic inflation, uh, the rapid expansion of the universe uh, soon after uh, its, uh, its origin. And this is more a stochastic gravitational wave background. It's like a random noise, as you can hear uh, in this also animation. Okay, so we are now um, uh, uh, going uh, into the uh, next generation, uh, uh, first of all, next runs for this uh, decade, first of all. So what's the landscape? Uh, what I'm showing here is the noise spectral density of the detectors uh, of LIGO actually as a function of frequency and the improvement in sensitivity over time. Um, the third run of LIGO Virgo uh, was um, uh, completed uh, uh, more than a year ago but the data were, all the data were analyzed, made uh, also public just during the last uh, month. And uh, the observatories are going to go back uh, online in, uh, at the end of next year with the so-called fourth run. This is basically the distance at which we can see parts. And if you look at the progression in time, uh, this is uh, 04 for next year that we will see also the Japanese detector Kagra. And then even in the future with a more sensitive detector, uh, we will have um, uh, new runs like O5 sometime in 2025, 26. And I want uh, uh, very happy to say that at that point, uh, we expect also to have uh, LIGO India, uh, which uh, will uh, allow to not just improve the sensitivity, but uh, also enhance uh, the possibility uh, the sky localization uh, because of the position of the detector with respect to the other detectors on the world in the world. But I want also to say that uh, uh, many scientists uh, in uh, in India are already participating in many of the analyses that I was uh, describing before as part of the LIGO India scientific collaboration. Uh, uh, many institutions are part of it, including actually your institution. And just a more few words about LIGO India. Uh, so this uh, project was approved, I understand, by the Union Cabinet uh, uh, back in 2016. A site uh, has been identified uh, in uh, the region of uh, Maharashtra. And um, uh, it's under the, it's going through a construction phase. And we all hope that uh, sometime, as I said, in 2026, um, this uh, new interferometer will also become, um, uh, you know, will, will be running and, and taking data. Uh, okay, let me conclude. Um, so 
uh, I was uh, having this um, uh, plot before, uh, emphasizing the region that uh, will uh, has been opened by LIGO and Virgo, uh, even more into uh, the future for this decade with Kagra and LIGO India. Um, but uh, uh, in the near future, in the next decade, we will have uh, a new uh, facility in um, experiment in space, which is called LISA. You see here an animation of the three satellite. This is the interferometer uh, going uh, around the, uh, the sun, uh, lagging uh, you know, behind the Earth and measuring gravitational waves in the milli Earth. And finally, uh, we hope to have also in the next decade uh, new facilities uh, on the ground, uh, the Einstein telescope and the Cosmic Explorer, which are going to broaden uh, the um, um, up to actually uh, around one Earth, three Earths, allowing actually to look at black holes up to the moment in which the first stars formed, when the universe was 10, 20 times smaller. Uh, while LISA will allow to see the merger of supermassive black holes, for example, at the center of galaxies. So all complementary sources with respect to what we have seen today. So before I finish, I want to thank uh, uh, the people of my group because many of the things I said are based on their work and of course of the work also of the LIGO, Virgo and Kaga collaboration. And so thank you very much and stay tuned. Sorry to take uh, uh, maybe more time <laughs> than uh, was supposed to take, but I now can take some questions. No problem. Thank you so much, Alessandra, for this very interesting and exciting talk. Uh, so, in fact, we also had uh, interesting discussions over chat, and that's very exciting. So, our team has collated uh, uh, questions, and uh, it seems there are many. So, probably okay. we won't. <laughs> I think we probably won't be able to go over all because that will take up a lot of time of yours. So, maybe we can pick uh, some questions from this list. I hope that's okay with you. Yeah, actually, better you choose the question because uh, I'm not see. I see there are forty. Yeah, so we have collected. So I will. I will just uh, uh, state these questions and um, uh, you know uh, feel free to answer. So uh, so the first question was asked by Aman Jha, uh, and his question is uh, how gravitational waves are detected uh, that it came from that particular event as it may overlap with other waves from other events, how we come to know exactly about the source of gravitational waves? Yes. Uh, OK. Um, so this is, uh, of course, uh, a very natural question to ask. Um, at the moment, uh, we are lucky because we are not seeing overlapping signals just because the event rates is not uh, uh, you know, very, very high. So um, we are um, seeing, uh, in fact, I think uh, the case in which um, uh, I think we had in one day two events, because you see, I, uh, I was saying the names of the events uh, uh, represent the day, the month, and the year. It turns out that now we have another way of naming, I mean, um, we, we name them uh, even with a longer name, but also the hour, the minutes, and the second, because in one case, I think, or a couple of cases, we had two events in one day. But uh, your question is very good if we think about the future. Uh, starting from uh, even the Einstein telescope and Cosmic Explorer, we are going to see many, many events at the same time. And these events will last for hours. Uh, and uh, in that case, there will be an overlap. And people have written some paper even recently, try to work out you know, that analysis scheme that allows actually to um, uh, basically uh, be able to disentangle the two events and uh, be sure that we are identifying both of them. In LISA will be also similar. In LISA, we will see many events at the same time, even of different kinds of sources. But for the moment, we are not actually having this problem. I see. Okay, thanks for answering that. Uh, the next question is from Rohan Shur, and he's asking uh, if black holes are of no matter, what happens to the used up stellar fuel of the star as it collapses? Okay, so once uh, the star, for the black hole that comes from the collapse of star, and the star collapses, 
the star, the material goes, I mean, you form a black hole, and then the material goes inside. And um, I had at some point a little picture that was showing what happened to a, a person when he falls into the black hole that is squeezed and stretched. Well, the material is completely, you know, destroyed because the pool, the gravitational pool is very strong. And uh, so basically it just, uh, you know, disappears, but it goes into a growth of the mass of the, determining the mass of the black hole. I mean, you don't have matter, but uh, the object, uh, uh, it's, you know, you have, uh, it's worth space time. If you put uh, an object around, uh, a, a, an object in a uh, uh, circular orbit, you can measure the mass of that object. And it has a mass. So the mass continues to grow because of accretion and other things, but whatever goes inside uh, is destroyed. Okay. Yeah, so these are mostly the questions coming from undergraduates. Uh, next question is from Kaunit, uh, he's, and his question is, how do black holes have mass if they don't have matter? Well, okay, yes, uh, very natural. Well, it's because, uh, you know, uh, there's energy and mass, the two things uh, can be um, equivalent. And if you want, you have a region of space which is highly warped and uh, traps, if you want, uh, energy there. And uh, as I said, how do we know that there is that the object has a mass? Well, we can use uh, the fact that we put uh, a satellite around on a circular orbit and use the Newton law, Kepler law, to determine the mass of the central object. That's the way in which we know that there is a mass, okay, there. But it can be also just energy of the space-time, warp space-time. It's not material mass, not made of uh, proton neutrons and... Uh, Okay, uh, next question is from Ahan Nag, and his question is, what does it mean for time to be wrapped around a black hole? Time to be wrapped? Wrapped around the black hole, that's what. Ah, so, well, uh, I, well, I don't know if I understand the question, but uh, maybe what uh, the person is asking is the fact that uh, time, uh, the, the pace of time uh, changes, whether you are close to a black hole or you are on the earth. Because uh, the way in which uh, uh, time, you know, elapses depend on uh, uh, the gravitational field. Um, and um, so in that sense, uh, if you are, uh, the way in which, um, uh, you know, there is always this uh, 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 story that one, you know, makes, if you have a twin, so one goes away from the earth and goes close to a black hole and then comes back, uh, they don't have any more the same age. Uh, the, the person who remains on the earth has aged more with respect to the other one. I don't know if you meant this. I mean, time is relative, okay? Yeah. Okay, we can move to the next question then. Uh, uh, so the next question is uh, from Dhairia and he's asking, how do we measure the intensity of a gravitational wave and how is it related to the power of a wave? Yeah, so, well, um, we do measure, um, so the gravitational strain, uh, at some point I had this uh, slide where I was, uh, uh, maybe I can take back the, so, um, yeah. So in this slide, I was saying that uh, the strain depends on uh, the time derivative of the quadruple of the object and the distance. So we measure the strain. Mm -hmm. So when, uh, when we detect a wave, uh, we are measuring basically the strain. So we are extracting the parameters. We are extracting the distance. Actually, I didn't parameter. It's also proportional to the total mass, to the mass of the binary. So we extract this information. We know what is the mass, what is the distance, etc. And once you know this, you know also the luminosity because the luminosity is basically a time derivative of h squared. Like in electromagnetism, no? uh, the, the luminosity is computed from the uh, electromagnetic field, that take right. one derivative square. Is the same, the same is true also for the gravitational wave. So by extracting the parameters, the properties of the wave, you can infer 
the luminosity of the event. Right. Okay, so moving to the next question. Uh, Rohan Efshir is asking if uh, gravitational wave travels at the speed of light, how is it different from electromagnetic waves? Uh, yeah, well, um, there are, you know, um, many, I would say, all massless particles uh, travel yeah. at the speed of light. Uh, but the question is uh, through which medium they travel. Uh, so gravitational waves uh, are really traveling through the space time itself. So think about, uh, for example, you know, sounds travels through, a, a, a needs a, a medium to travel is the air, okay? Yeah. Uh, in the case of gravitational waves, the gravitational waves are traveling in the space time itself, in the sense the space time is, uh, as the gravitational waves pass through, is actually squeezed and stretched. I mean, if you attach to this space time some probe, you know, particles that can freely move, they are going to be stretched and, uh, and squeezed as the gravitational waves pass through. Uh, but also, I mean, light, again, in optical, you can see it. Gravitational waves, you don't see them, you know? It's not, uh, so they are different. I see. Is it okay if we uh, have two, one or two more yeah, questions? Yeah, yeah. I still okay. have time. If, um, if you have time. Oh, no, no, sure, sure. Okay, so the next question is from Priyanshu, and he's asking, uh, can we differentiate between gravitational waves created due to different astrophysical objects, like the ones created from black hole, black hole interactions or black hole neutron star interactions? Yes. Uh, yes, yes, because uh, um, so when uh, um, I was describing the uh, um, signal that I was showing here. So if you have a, a system where you have only two black holes, uh, the system, the, the gravitational waves is described by a certain number of parameters. Actually, there are 15 parameters, there are many. Uh, but uh, if you have a neutral star in the binary, there is another parameter, which is this uh, tidal, the formation parameter uh, that describe the tides uh, that the neutron star is subject to, like the tides of the of the moon on the Earth, and uh, these tides change the um, the gravitational waveform. So, uh, if you compare with a binary black hole, they are different, and so because we use again uh, these uh, templates to match and extract the parameters. The template will be different. It is the template of a neutron star black hole, which allows for this tidal deformability. And so when we match, we don't get a very good agreement with a, a black hole, black hole template, but we get a very good agreement. The best fit will come from a neutron star black hole template. Okay, does it make sense? Okay. okay. Yes, thank you. Uh... From Somanko, and his question is: When a black hole and a neutron star merge to form a black hole, uh, what happens to the matter of the neutron star? Yeah, so um, that is, uh, you know, when I was showing uh, this uh, simulation here, in part uh, you see what is happening. So um, when the two neutron star merge, uh, they are made of neutrons, and they eject some of these neutrons. In fact, the material that is ejected that you see here in violet in a moment is rich of neutrons. And in fact, this material goes through these processes that is called R rapid, rapid uh, uh, neutron uh, capture, uh, rapid uh, uh, R processes, and they decay. They, they are the one that actually emit uh, this optical uh, kilonova, you know, infrared signal. And then you have a disk around that can form uh, and then you have a black hole at the center. And over time, you know, the, the, the disk, the black hole can accrete this disk. So the material, just to say, the material either, you know, produce electromagnetic radiation, it can stay around the black hole at the end. Okay, so there are two more questions that we have our list. Um, uh, the next question is from Shurem, and he's asking, can we make contact inside and outside of black hole by using the phenomenon of entanglement of particles? Ah, uh, 
Okay, maybe this is more a question for string theorists <laughs> in, the, in the room. <laughs> um, I mean, the only thing I want to say is that for what I understand, for, for example, uh, uh, the um, Hawking radiation is not a consequence of, uh, um, you know, um, this uh, production of uh, um, uh, pair production, so very close to a black hole that one goes inside, the other outside. But anyway, I don't, uh, this cannot prove that we gravitational waves. Uh, so I, I, I don't think I can answer this question, but again, if someone in the room can answer, I would uh, leave the question to someone else. Okay, anyone would like to answer? Anyone in the audience? Any? Okay, uh, otherwise let's move to the last question in this list. Um, and that's from Kaunit. Uh, if both gravitational waves and gamma rays travel at the speed of light, then why was there a two second delay in the signal, a GW170817? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. For what I understand, there was a delay due to the way in which uh, uh, actually the uh, gamma ray was produced. Uh, I mean, if they are produced exactly at the same time, then I agree they should arrive at the same time. But the fact is that the gamma ray was produced, uh, for what I understand, um, in some sense, the, 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 um, you know, the, the, uh, once the two objects collide with each other, um, the material, a, a jet was formed, and it took some time for the jet to penetrate, uh, you know, around the material. And so this, I think, is explained as a slight delay, um, you know, that caused that. But certainly, there is no, this delay is not due to the speed uh, of the two um, uh, probes, uh, messengers, because in fact, uh, that event was used to probe, uh, to set uh, this the strongest uh, um, bound on the speed of gravitational waves with respect to the speed of light of the order of 10 to the minus 15, 16, the fractional variation. So that event was used actually to set the, the bound of gravitational waves with respect to the speed of light. Okay. So I think we are done with the uh, questions. So uh, thank you once again, uh, Alessandra. Oh, thank for you uh, taking also some, for the many all, questions. And... All the questions. Uh, so Tarun, over to you. Yeah. Do you... Uh, so thanks again, Alexandra. I mean, I'm, uh, I, I should mention it was lovely that you could join. I, I know it was a very busy period for the collaboration with you know, all these papers and I'm sure you'd the thick of it. And uh, we hope you would be able to visit us. I mean, you have visited uh, Pune before, but uh, yes, that's true. Uh, I should mention this is a very interesting place to visit if you love students, because we have you know, probably the best selection of uh, undergraduates who are just dying to know more about the subject. Okay, and, uh, okay. And, and there's a huge amount of excitement in the country uh, you know, in hope of uh, Ligo India coming up very soon. And, you know, so gravitational waves is probably one of the most, uh, uh, you know, followed uh, subjects in the country now. So I um, hope to see you in person soon. I uh, hope uh, the pandemic yeah. is over. And we... thank, you. thank you very much, uh, first of all, to, for having me here. As I said, it was very really an honor. And uh, I look forward to visit. Uh, I really enjoyed the visit. I think it was in 2006. But yeah, let's hope that the situation improved for everybody uh, with the pandemic, that we can uh, start traveling again. Um, right. uh, anyway, thank you again and thank you for the questions. Thanks. Um, bye. Bye bye. Thank you thank once you. again. Thank you. Bye bye.